crazy that I'm here talking to a camera like it's an actual person. Okay. <laughs> it's really giving mental illness. But Okay, so hey everybody, um, my name is Neka Uchendu and this is my first YouTube video. Oh my God. As you guys can see here, I have my two co-hosts, Onyx and Zola here. Onyx, can you have a seat, please? Can you have a seat? Sit. Thank you. <laughs> so this is my very first... We want to tussle. Because you, you know mommy's trying to work. You know mommy's trying to work. Come on now. This is going to be basically just a Q&A, getting to know everything about me. Bruh. You guys submitted a ton of questions. And first of all, shout out to y'all. Shout out to the gang. Because when I tell you, you guys came through and I'm so glad that I was able to answer each and every one. So yes, please stay tuned if you guys want to hear about this journey. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Mm, mm, mm. I can't believe I'm saying that now. Like, girl. The very first question is, so how did I get into medicine and my school journey? Um, what inspired me to become a physician? And um, do I regret it in hindsight? My initial catalyst for wanting to do medicine was definitely my parents. I remember I was like five years old in kindergarten. You know, they're asking you what you want to be, what uh, field you want to pursue. And I remember telling my mother that I wanted to go into design, specifically fashion design. And um, she completely shot that down. <laughs> she was basically like, no, you're going to be a doctor. And I was like, okay, you know, not really, really understanding what that meant. As time went on, I realized that I was, I had like zero artistic ability as it related to drawing. Um, and I was just naturally more gifted in like the maths and sciences. So eventually, you know, a field in medicine, I mean, a, a career in medicine just seemed like a more logical fit. Um, and as time went on, I just realized that I, um, you know, it became very apparent that I was a naturally high achieving student. Like I was pretty much a straight A student all of my life, except that one B that I got in sixth grade social studies, 89% and that witch of a teacher would not bump up my grade. If you're watching this and <laughs> you see, you didn't stop nothing. Anyway, um, so yes, always was a very naturally high achieving student. Always, uh, I was pretty much a straight A student from kindergarten through undergrad. In high school, I attended Willow Canyon um, High School in Surprise, Arizona. Go Wildcats. And um, I pretty much took all advanced um, classes. The classes are were called International Baccalaureate classes or IB courses which is basically just AP, but on an international level. You know, I really got strays in all of my classes. For extracurriculars, I was a part of the varsity track team for all four years of freshman. I mean, from all four years of high school, from freshman to senior year. And I was also a part of two dance teams, specifically hip hop and contemporary. I ended up graduating uh, number one in my class. So I was class valedictorian with a GPA of 4.79. I ended up getting really high marks on all of my um, IB exams, like five to seven. So I was able to uh, get a lot of college credit because of that. So in addition to my academic accolades, I also was Scholar Athlete of the Year um, for 2012 and 2013 and continued with dance also all four years. So definitely very active um, in school and was very, very dedicated. So yeah, um, for undergrad, I attended Arizona State on a full academic uh, scholarship. At my alma mater, I ended up studying uh, biological sciences with a concentration in biomedical sciences, as well as a minor in Spanish. During that undergraduate period, I was pre-medicine the entire time. Like I was in regular contact with my advisors to ensure that I was taking the correct prerequisites in order to attend medical school. In addition to being on that pre-med track, I was also uh, enrolled in the at Barrett, the Honors College um, at Arizona State, which meant that in addition to my uh, pre-med prerequisites, I was also taking um, advanced uh, honors classes 
um, as well as had a requirement for an honors thesis in order to graduate from the um, from the honors college. My honors thesis ended up being about the social um, implications of the media in plastic surgery. Because at the time I thought I was going to be a plastic surgeon and I ended up also being involved um, outside of my um, academics was regularly involved in other extracurriculars um, such as I you know I worked part-time as a student that's really like as like the on-campus jobs are really the plug because they give you the ability I mean it gives you the space and the capacity to study while also getting paid so I was definitely hopping from um, on-campus job to on-campus job whichever one was paying more um, and then I was also involved in volunteering at my local hospitals um under various positions just to kind of get a feel of if i thought i wanted to do any of the specialties outside of surgery outside of my honors thesis just because that took up so much of my time i did start to dabble in like you know some you know participating in some of the um the biomedical research labs on campus but because my honors thesis was taking so much time i decided to focus more of my energy on that and that research project ended up getting um awarded a scholarship through the National Science Foundation. Um, so as a post scholar, I was, uh, you know, my research was funded and it was basically, uh, I was able to present my my findings um, in DC at a uh, post scholar research uh, symposium. I really did like uh, buckle down during undergrad. I mean, that's not to say I didn't have a little fun, okay? But it was always after exams, after, you know, the hard work and everything was done. I did end up, graduating number one in my class at arizona state with a graduating class of like over six thousand and i graduated with a gpa of 4.0 i ended up also graduating from barris the honors college because i successfully defended my honors thesis um and ended up being awarded the moore award for academic excellence because i got a 4.0 gpa for all eight semesters so after undergrad um i ended up going into medical school not that long after and i attended wayne state school of medicine in detroit michigan during medical school i definitely took my foot off the gas okay because i was like look we're here as long as we as long as we don't get kicked out we're gonna get that md at the end right so i was that was really that was really my mindset like p equals md that was me okay i was not trying to honor i was not trying to be the you know be number one because you know i have been straight student all my life like i was just like you know i have nothing to prove at this point like i got into medical school how many people can say that not that many okay so if it was easy everybody would do it you feel me um my board scores ended up being average and um i did end up honoring in several of my uh, clinical uh, clerkships or if I didn't honor I did receive like clinical commendations and things of that nature um, and I for extracurriculars like who freaking has time for that but like, <laughs> medical school just takes so much of your time that like when they say oh what did you do outside of medical school I'm like what did you do outside of medical school like nothing sleep for extracurriculars I did have one or two research activities I think one case report and like a couple of presentations then COVID happened and pretty much, you know, like, of course, all of my clinical clerkships had gotten shortened and all of our electives got removed. Um, so when it came time fourth year to decide on a specialty, you know, I ended up applying orthopedic surgery and unfortunately went unmatched, as you guys are aware, in uh, 2022. And since then, I have moved back in with my mama to recuperate financially, find a job and end up reapplying and uh, matching it to anesthesia. That was question number one. Whew. Like, baby. That was just question number one. We still have to get into the other questions. So anyway, now that we've answered that, let's get into the next question. Do I freaking regret it? Um, absolutely not, babes. Absolutely not. Knowing what I know now, I would have still applied to medicine because realistically, I just don't see myself doing anything else. Like the the joy and the sense of purpose that you get from helping someone in their most vulnerable state like there's no greater feeling like let me just be completely honest with you yes the training is tough it is tumultuous to say the least 
but when you get to the end and i'm not even at the end yet babes i still gotta survive residency but i know that when i get to the end it is gonna be glorious i've already completed eight years of my training what's another four if we're if we're gonna be be for real i did not come this far to only come this far um and that has just been my mindset especially after going unmatched to pick up the pieces and get back on the horse so yeah i do not regret it babes and if you're in the midst of something and you're wondering is this for me is this pray on it that needs to be step number one pray on it get closer to god and he will reveal everything to you next question is did you take any gap years before medical school and were you a traditional medical student i would definitely say that i was a traditional medical student um i pretty much went straight into medical school after undergrad um and everything that i did academically was definitely in preparation for the goal of going to medical school like i knew i wanted to be a doctor at a very young age um, and so everything that I was doing was to achieve that goal. Um, but I did take a gap year. I did take one gap year between medical school and undergrad. Um, and that was actually to reapply to medicine for the second time. Yes, baby, I did not get into medical school the first time. Uh, the very first time that I applied, um, I submitted my application like two or three months late after the uh, application had opened. Um, and this was because I was you know trying to go back and forth should i take the mcat again and then also one of my letter writers was acting a little funny and i thought i had to have all my letters before i submitted but don't be like me baby submit that application whether you have the letters or not okay whether you have the letters or not submit the application at least get your foot in the door decided not to take the mcat again because i was just like yeah i'm not going through that exam again I'm not going through the exam again and also re diversified the programs that i was going to apply to so the very first time around i felt like i applied to too many reach schools and then on top of that i applied to them late so it's like girl what was you doing what was you thinking you're right i wasn't okay i wasn't thinking i wasn't i didn't have any type of guidance really no you know advisors they, I mean, they were pretty much all saying like, yeah, you're going to get in. Like, you got the scores. But nobody was really guiding me. I had to literally, like, figure this shit out on my own. And that's why I'm here to tell you exactly what to do so that you can be more successful than I was. I ended up diversifying the program list to include a few REACH schools, but mostly schools within my REACH. Um, I ended up uh, applying to 20 programs. Also, during my gap year, I, you know, wanted to seem productive. And that's really what you should be doing in between, you know, in those gap years is making you know, building your CV and doing things that are going to be productive. Of course, take time for yourself, you know, like explore your hobbies and your interests and everything like that. But more than anything, you need to be building up that CV. Um, so during that time, I took up an internship. That's what they called it. Um, but it was basically, I was working at a private orthopedic clinic under the direction of an uh, orthopedic hand surgeon and his physician assistant. And basically, it was just like mini residency. You know, I was responsible for pre rounding on the patients, um, rooming the patients, taking the history, performing the physical exams, um, ordering the specific diagnostic exam. Um, and then attempting to interpret the results. Obviously, I didn't have all the medical jargon at the time in order to interpret them. But um, in addition to that, I was also doing a lot of ancillary um, activities, things like casting, cast removal, suture removal, conduction studies. It was definitely the most hands-on and involved medical experience that I had had up until that point. Because everything prior to that was mostly shadowing um, not that it wasn't extremely important and valuable um, because a lot of those experiences also yielded some of the letters that I would uh, use to apply to medical school. But this was definitely the most involved and strenuous and, um, and hands-on training that I had received up until that point. Um, it was also a very, very big selling point when I went on the interview uh, trail the second time after applying for the second time. Once um, a lot of the interviewers learned about this experience and learned that I would that I had done all these things they were blown away 
first of all, that a doctor would let me do that. <laughs> that um, I had had that experience prior to coming into medical school. I think I found that experience through my school. If you can find those type of experiences, definitely jump on those. But you know, you have to keep your eye out because obviously a whole bunch of other people are probably also going to apply. I know that he interviewed a few other people, but to God be the glory, I was the person that was selected. So so yeah, that's basically how I spent my, my gap year. So the next question is, how do you overcome imposter syndrome as a medical student? This is a heavy one because I think we've all experienced some feeling of imposter syndrome at one point or the other in our lives. And what I think is important to distinguish here is that at the core of imposter syndrome, is this feeling of inexperience and therefore this lack of self-confidence um and i've heard a lot of people say that like oh you know fake it until you make it or whatever but let's be for real that's bs that is bs okay because that type of thinking that type of ideology implies that you don't already have what you need to succeed but you do babes like you do the seat that you currently occupy Thousands of other people apply to be in that same seat, but you got accepted. So you have what it takes. I don't think it's fake it until you make it. I think it's believe it until you achieve it because baby, you occupy that seat. So own it. Nobody else got you there, got you to this point, except you and the favor of God aligning on your behalf. So own your position. You're already God's favorite. Why wouldn't things work out for you? Why wouldn't things that have already been aligning on your behalf continue to align? Like think to yourself, what if it does work out exactly as it's supposed to? This inexperience that you're feeling will turn into experience with time. You just have to give it time. You just have to be showing up to your clinicals ready to learn and facing your books every day unfortunately it's not something that is just going to come to you like that unfamiliar that unfamiliar territory will become second nature to you once you put in the time and you put in the hours okay you put in the days you put in the weeks showing up and doing what you're supposed to do every single time one day you're going to look back on this experience and wonder why you ever thought that you did not deserve to be here but again you have to be putting in that work surround yourself with peers and mentors who will challenge you guide you and encourage you along this journey because medical training is already hard enough it is already so hard trust me i know what you're going through it is already so hard without you doing it in isolation like surround yourself with those people who are looking out for you and it'll make the medical journey so much easier and you will realize like i really do got this okay so the next question is how to have a life in medical school that first year of medical school i definitely struggled having a social life and like trying to fall into a routine just because it's such a culture shift from undergrad to medical school and the volume of information like the way that you studied in undergrad is not going to get you through medical school like you have to learn relearn how to learn while also getting pummeled with information at levels that are just insurmountable to comprehend so i totally understand like that first year hell even the, the first two years sometimes was it was an, it was an adjustment like you really had to like figure out what worked for you and like tinker things here and there and i totally understand that volume of information and that way of life can seem incompatible to having a social life um but i will say that what worked out for me is scheduling everything so some of you guys might remember that i had this giant whiteboard in my bedroom um during medical school and basically at the beginning of every month I would update that whiteboard with whatever learning topics that I wanted to tackle during my study schedule. I would schedule my workouts for that day. I would um, plan, I would put out my meals and then any important dates like testing, appointments, even social events I put onto that calendar so that with every day I knew what it was that I needed to tackle. 
um, and would just check things off as you know as time went on and then academically like managing um, your academics during medical school the thing that you have to realize is that in order to retain that volume of information well first of all you're not going to retain every single detail like you have to focus on the high yield stuff and in order to really focus and retain that high yield information you have to employ spaced repetition meaning that you have to see this information and review it multiple times over a set number of days weeks months in order for it to become second nature and for you to recognize it when you see it again that's basically what i employed during my uh, study schedule was that i would focus on the high yield information from each lecture and then i would drill myself through practice questions and focus on the ones that i got wrong and why i got them wrong when that study schedule the time that i allotted for my study schedule when that time expired whether the study session went good or bad i closed my laptop i closed my notebook and went to go do something for myself which meant for me that's really when i started to get serious about my weight training and so for me whether the study session went good or bad i was in the gym okay i was in the gym taking it out on some metal okay and then after that i would come home inhale my meal prep over a good show whether that be anime some k drama whatever babes i would inhale my meal prep over a good show and then take my ass to sleep because guess what those question bays are going to be there in the morning they're not going anywhere all that work is not going anywhere but your mental health and doing things for yourself you have to take time you have to take time for that and you shouldn't feel guilty about that because I know some people used to say like, oh, I feel guilty about going to the gym. Not me, babes. Not me. Like, we're gaining up here, but we got to gain everywhere else. You feel me? You feel me? Like, we're not going to slack. Not around here, partner. <laughs> not around here. Okay, so the next question is, how did you decide on what specialty to go into? So for me personally, during medical school, I definitely struggled having that career defining epiphany that I feel like a lot of my other classmates had. Um, as a pre-med, I knew that I loved working in the OR and was like initially really captivated by, you know, the surgical spectacle and the charisma of the surgeons. And so when it came to medical school, I just started to pour myself into surgery. I found that I was always more engaged in the OR than I was in like the outpatient setting. So that definitely narrowed down a lot of specialties for me. So I, you know, started to, you know, make my way through different surgical specialties. I realized that there were very few uh, surgical specialties that I actually enjoyed enough to want to pursue. And then COVID happened. Dun, dun, dun. And basically, my third year clerkships were all shortened. They removed all of the electives from our schedule in order for us to have, in order for us to graduate on time. Which you know, I'm I'm grateful for that because Lord knows I didn't want to graduate late. But it also was at a detriment to people like me who hadn't had that career defining epiphany in a specific specialty yet because I was like, uh, I mean, I guess I'll do this. You know, when it came time for fourth year. Um, and so for me, I had basically narrowed it down to orthopedic surgery or plastic surgery. After I kind of looked at the training for plastic surgery, I really realized that it was more trauma focused than it was cosmetic. And I liked the cosmetic aspect of plastic surgery more. I just ended up applying to orthopedic surgery at the time. Okay, so the next question is, is a lot of research needed to match into competitive specialties? I think that there are multiple factors that contribute to someone's ability to match into a competitive specialty in order to get into the door i think a the ideal candidate has to have good board scores and to have performed well during their third year clerkship rotations i do know some people who didn't have any research background but because they had super high board scores and did well on their clerkships they were able to match into competitive specialties you know for regular people for those of us who you know you know just went into medical school to pass you know maybe you just had uh maybe you had a couple red flags and maybe you didn't perform as well you know if you had average or you know below average board scores I do think that having a stronger research background shows um, dedication and also makes you a more well-rounded applicant because at the end of the day, although board scores and performing well in your third, uh, your third year does matter, I do feel as though most programs are looking for a more holistic candidate, someone who 
you know, has good board scores, extra has the extracurriculars, research, and strong letters of recommendation. I think checking off those boxes is definitely important. But let's say for at some reason, you know, you didn't have, you had average board scores, which was my situation. I did, I had ad, average board scores, but I feel like because of my strong clinical background um, in surgical specialties, as well as my um, my diverse research background. That gave, that gave me the edge over um, some other USMDs who were also applying. Because anesthesia is surprisingly becoming uh, more uh, competitive. Like in the last three or four years, the match rate for USMDs went from like high 90s, I think 96 or 98% and dropped down to like low 80s um in in this last cycle so like yeah there are a bunch of usmds who are going unmatched in competitive specialties but i do feel like something that can set you apart is that research experience and for me my research experience wasn't even in anesthesia i don't have a single anesthesia research publication on my cv let's get that straight my research um was in general surgery bioethics um, and more recently pediatric oncology from my research fellowship that i've been working at um, for these last two years um, since graduating from medical school i just think that having that diverse research background shows that you are a holistic candidate and also shows that you are willing to work because that's really what they want to see like are you going to put in the time are you going to put in the effort to achieve this goal and i just feel like using your time wisely especially your time off for medicine or whatever you know whatever stage you are in your medical journey like definitely showing that you're still being productive and building that cv um to be a stronger candidate when it does come time to apply so research isn't um i research isn't necessary but i think as these specialties are trending and as candidates are becoming more and more competitive and like their score, their board scores are getting higher and higher, research can really uh, separate you and like differentiate you from the crowd and you know, make you um, an ideal candidate. So the next question is ERAS, <laughs> ERAS cycle tips and basically what I did to strengthen um, and change my application applying the second time around. The very first thing that I did after going unmatched was to mourn that loss. That's what it is. It literally feels as though a part of you has died. Um, and you just have to take time to feel all those feelings because your feelings are valid. You know, you've worked so hard towards this goal. Um, and so if you're in that position, babe, I feel you cry as much as you need to you know but don't dwell that's that's really my biggest piece of advice do not dwell um and healing is not linear you're gonna have ups and downs you're gonna have good days and bad days but you have to get back on the horse and keep going so after i mourned that loss i definitely reached out to my mentors my uh people that i had interviewed with like the programs that i previously interviewed with as well as touch base with reapplicants within the field. Um, so at that time, I thought I was going to be reapplying to orthopedic surgery. So I was just touching base with all the orthopedic surgery reapplicants and just, um, you know, discuss my my interviews, discuss my application, um, and then any tips that they could give me related to you know preparing to reapply again. And the common theme that I got during these communications was that my application could stand to be stronger in the research department. With that in mind, I basically just started um, reapplying to a whole bunch of orthopedic research uh, positions. And I probably did that for three months after, um, after going unmatched. Match season is in, in March and our graduation for wayne state doesn't happen until june so those three months i was basically just applying like a mad woman to various orthopedic research positions and um, would get to the final round of interviews at several and then they would say oh we went with a different candidate so after several unsuccessful interviews i ended up um moving from detroit michigan packing up the last of my stuff and moving back home with my mama okay moving back into my mama's house to figure my shit out and uh save money because i was broke i was so broke like 
so broke okay <laughs> living off food stamps and everything broke okay i moved back in with my mom and basically just at that time i decided to just broaden my research interests because at that after three months of rejection i was like you know what <laughs> as long as i get a research position i'm good okay a win is a win okay slow motion is better than no motion i diversifying my research interests to include pretty much any specialty within medicine and at first i was applying through indeed linkedin base don't do that i'm gonna tell you that right now don't waste your time on linkedin and indeed those posts are garbage i don't even know if they're checking it okay i must have sent a hundred i must have sent hundreds of applications ain't nobody get back to me not one and i'll tell you which ones actually responded to my application when i applied directly through the career hospital websites so i would go to the career pages of the hospitals in the uh, houston area so for you in your local area go directly to their career pages type in research in the keyword um the keyword box and apply to all those research positions because that's exactly what i did and it didn't matter the level whether whether it was a research assistant one research assistant three i was applying to every single one okay and i probably did that and submitted hundreds when i say hundreds of applications this is not an exaggeration you guys like because i know some people would like to say oh hundreds of applications like no babes i would wake up and just be applying i would apply until i was blue in the face all day for like two months um this is two months after the three months that i had just spent applying for orthopedic surgery um positions after about two months of um applying you know through the career pages of these various hospitals i ended up accepting a position um, in a pediatric oncology bench lab, which is, you're thinking, oh, you know, chem lab during undergrad, that's basically what this felt like. Um, so bench slash wet lab setting um, within the pediatric oncology department. And I specifically chose a PI who during the interview, um, I, you know, basically expressed that, you know, I was a medical grad, you know, that obviously I was on my CV, a medical school grad. Um, and that I wanted to be in a bench lab setting that the work that I did would contribute, like they would be willing to um, include me on the research publications. Um, and there are a couple of people that, you know, de declined to doing that, that basically just wanted you to work for them. But I, the PI that I worked under agreed to put me on any, basically any work that I did would that contributed to a specific research project that i would get authorship on that so something just to build the cv and supplement what you're doing while also you know also gaining some so a little bit of coin here on the side so my responsibilities included uh, conducting the virology experiments that included managing their mice colonies so that was the breeding, dissecting, and harvesting of hematopoietic organs of these uh, mice that were infected with leukemia. And then I would be conducting um, and managing their various petri dishes that were <laughs> that were doing all types of experiments and reactions and, and things of that nature. Um, and I basically did that um, for six months. Um, and I was, you know, an MD and a basic research assistant position. I was so grateful for that position <laughs> just because um, I knew that the work that I was contributing contributing to would ultimately supplement my CV and my PI also agreed to write me a letter of recommendation for residency even though I was you know in a position that was so far outside of clinical medicine. Um, that work ended up yielding two publications, poster presentation and abstract, as well as a letter, a strong letter of recommendation that was regularly talked about during my interviews. In the midst of it, you didn't really know where this was going or what was going on, but that position ended up yielding the the um, some of the strongest parts of my CV that set me apart from other candidates when it came time to for me to reapply. Um, and that's also a part of the reason why I did not reapply the cycle immediately after I went unmatched because, you know, the match day happens on in March and then the next cycle is expected to submit their applications in September, which is only six months. And six months for me just was not enough time. Like I, it literally took me five months to get that job. 
Um, and there's no way I would have had a change in my application between that time. I wasn't in the mental or financial space to reapply the cycle immediately after my cycle. So I, I took a breather for medicine. Um, and I basically was in a position that was just so far out of clinical medicine, but it brought me ultimately brought me back to exactly where I needed to be. And after those six months, I ended up um, pivoting to a job within the same department. Um, but on the clinical side now, as a clinical research uh, associate or CRA, basically the position that I hold right now, and I'm managing various uh, drug treatment clinical trials within the pediatric oncology department. That has been the job that I've been maintaining now for the past uh, like year and a half. And yeah, also while um, working these various uh, research positions, I was also reaching out to anesthesiologists in my area to see if I could shadow them. But the thing about being an MD with no license means that you also have no malpractice insurance. So a lot of hospitals don't want you to work there because even though you're shadowing you have no direct patient contact you're still a liability so uh, after much trial and error you know reaching out to various anesthesiologists and getting rejected um, i ended up finding the perfect mentor i would shadow him once or twice a month um and during his entire shift and you know that experience basically cemented why i wanted to be an anesthesiologist once i kind of saw like exactly how diverse their workflow was and you know just the pace at which they worked i just i just knew that it was it was it was definitely for me it was definitely the type of uh, specialty that i could see myself doing all these experiences basically helped me to um you know supplement my heiress application and also rewrite a lot of the core parts of it um especially things like my personal statement um you know the personal statement that i ended up writing was completely different from the first one that i had written and it was deeply personal because i touched on you know going unmatched and the growth and development that i've experienced over these last um over the last two well at the time it was one year but you know over the last year um and like why that uh how that contributed to my decision to be an anesthesiologist and um i felt like that definitely also helped set me apart from other candidates because I had went through something really traumatic, like really hard and came out stronger on the other side. And it was definitely like a major talking point during the interview trail. So, uh, you know, when it came time to submit my applications, I just felt incredibly confident about my application. I felt inc incredibly confident about where I was. And that's really just, you know, the favor of God. That's really just the peace of God, just because you know, I had these really strong letters of recommendation, these two mentors that were in my corner and like really supporting me and supporting my journey. For that I'm so grateful because I didn't know, but I also kind of knew that this was my time. I was just standing on that. When it came time for the interview, I just knew that like the favor that God has been showing me throughout this entire season, I just need to continue to pray for that and, and, and just convey the growth and the development that I had had over the last year, year and a half prior to the interview. The next question is about overcoming rejection and then tips on uh, focusing on the goal after failure and coming back stronger after a setback. I think the first step to overcoming rejection is accepting it. For someone like me, very, very hard headed. Okay, very, very hard headed. It was, that was probably the hardest part. A lot of people will say, you know, it's God's will. It, it, you don't want to hear that. In that moment, like, you don't want to hear that it's God's will and everything like, like, you're pissed. You're angry. You feel betrayed and your feelings are so valid. Feel all the feels. Get mad, get sad, feel dejected, scream, cry, you know, break shit maybe don't maybe don't break things if you can't replace it whatever you have to do to release you know that emotion to feel that cathartic feeling feel like do it feel it you are in the right because at the end of the day nobody was there with you in the trenches when you were putting in that work like nobody knows what it took to get there and especially with the match like that happens at the 11th hour of your medical journey like you've been working for towards this goal for the past four years and a month to three months before graduation you ain't got no job you don't know where you're going like what the hell i was so angry i felt so betrayed also along my healing journey 
you know, I, even though I gave myself that grace to feel all the emotions and everything, I went into isolation and I became very depressed. It was like overthinking and fixating, you know, what could I have done differently? What could I, what, what can I do better? Like, is it me? Is it me? It's not you, babes. It's a computerized algorithm. Some of the ca candidates got some little nepotism and they got the little, they got some people in their back pockets on the real. And for me, I didn't have none of that. I am the first doctor in my family. We didn't have any of that type of support. I didn't have the finance. I didn't have nothing, okay? Like, you just have your wit and your grit. That's it. And it felt like, I didn't have any, I didn't have a leg to stand on. With that being said, please understand that healing is a journey. And that's something that I did not understand because I had never been through anything like this. I had never experienced depression before. Um, I had always been a very confident person. This was new for me, um, especially as a naturally high achieving student. Like this is not the equivalent of getting a C on an exam or something like that. Like, yes, that sucks, but this is cataclysmic professional rejection. Like it, it hits a little different. Um, and so for me, I was wondering, you know, after three months, six months, nine months, why am I not feeling any better? I really felt like I was like, one day I'm just gonna wake up and it's just gonna feel, I'm gonna feel better, I'm gonna be me again. And the thing is like, you're never gonna be you again. Like you went through something traumatic and it changed you. That's what trauma does. It changes you, it leaves scars, but you are supposed to change for the better. Don't think that you're going to wake up one day and everything's just gonna be rainbows and daisies. That is unrealistic. You went through something traumatic, you're gonna have the scars to show for it. This feeling that you're feeling right now, it's not forever. And I can't tell you whether it's gonna be three months, six months. I think for me, it took over a year before I started to feel like myself and start to get my confidence back again. I wanna say like, like 13, 14 months before I really started to feel like myself again, before I really started to feel like that girl. Because you are that girl. Like, yeah, you might have been knocked down. Or or that boy, if you're, if you're a guy watching this. You really are that person. Like, don't let anybody, any situation, make you doubt yourself. Because you have what it takes. You just have to come with a little different strategy. That's it. Little by little, day by day, you will get better. And it, that trauma will occupy less of your mental space until one day you realize that you didn't think about it at all that day and that's how you know you're healing that's how you know you're healing when you're when it doesn't take up every single thought that you think so don't rush the healing process and that was also part of the reason why i made the decision to step away from social media for like almost two years it was just really hard for me to see my classmates moving on you know living out their dreams and for me to feel as though i was running in place um, and I didn't really know what I was doing. Social media just makes you compare, you know, that's the problem. And comparison is really the thief of joy. Once I cut out social media and started focusing on my own goals, that's really when things started to fall into place for me. I didn't really have an understanding of where I was going or what I was doing, but I was still putting myself out there. Like I was still networking. I was still sending out hundreds of emails to find the right mentor, to find the right PI uh, in the right research lab. Even though I didn't know what the future held, I knew that complacency kills dreams faster than any disease. I was, one thing I was not gonna be was complacent. I was not gonna dwell on those feelings even though I felt them. I was gonna do everything that I could do to get myself out of that situation. And so yeah, when I was in the research lab, you know, working with my pipetting media into Petri dishes, I could not have imagined that that position would be the catalyst for my CRA position, working with 20 plus PIs, managing drug treatment trials um, for, for clinical studies. And I could not have imagined that that position would have yielded the publications, poster presentations um, that would ultimately uh, supplement my CV for my reapplication um, into residency. I was so grateful just to have a job and just to you know be included on the research projects. And I feel like that was a distinguishing uh, factor for me because even in the midst of that uncertainty, I was still grateful. Um, and I think the important thing is like you really do, do just have to like lock in and be grateful with the grit um, and have actionable goals that you're trying to achieve and work towards them diligently um, and 
just just keep the faith babes keep the faith like you have no idea what god has in store for you in your future like your future is so bright and if you even caught a glimpse of what god has in store for you you would not sweat this waiting season that you're in just know that this waiting season is not a wasted season your future your victory is coming okay so the next question is how to maximize your time off medical school one of the things that i think that you should do to maximize your time off of medical school is to pour into the habits and the hobbies that have been on pause for the last four to eight years really pour into those things that bring you joy like for me that meant traveling that meant getting a second dog shout out to onyx big boy onyx okay that meant um reading for pleasure again because i had only ever read for school i didn't even know what genres i enjoyed reading anymore um and so yeah definitely reading for pleasure dating and that just doesn't just mean romantically i, I did a lot of friend dates too and like trying to figure myself out and figure out what i wanted and who i was and and so yeah just just trying to find out who you are outside of medicine i feel like should really be at the core of taking your time off of what you do when you take time off from medicine because you probably won't have this most consecutive free time ever again if we're really going to be for real next question is over the past two years what is something that you've rediscovered about yourself i think that it would be my empathy and my passion for um, inspiring and mentoring people, um, especially those in the medical field. So when I went unmatched, I was so angry. Was angry with God, angry at myself, really angry at the world. And I just felt betrayed by the medical community. And there were still some people who were reaching out to me for, for mentorship. And I just did not feel as though I was in the right headspace to be guiding and encouraging people to pursue a field in medicine because i wasn't even sure i wanted to pursue a field in medicine like if we're gonna be completely honest if we're gonna be completely honest i was not even sure that i wanted to be a doctor at that time so yeah when i had finally accepted that that door was closed and there was absolutely nothing that i could do to open it i started to Re regroup and refocus my efforts towards surgical adjacent fields like anesthesia and um you know just that time with my mentor basically i started to fall in love with medicine all over again now that i finally achieved this goal of matching into a competitive specialty i finally feel as though i'm in uh the mental headspace to inspire people and to um you know encourage people to to pursue a field in medicine so yeah, definitely the, the empathy and the, the mentorship aspect. So the next question is, what did you do to support yourself mentally and physically after going unmatched besides working out and praying? <laughs> and it's funny that you say besides working out and praying because that's really the majority of what I did. Um, and I hate to break it to you, but I had to feed my body as well as my spirit in order to fully understand why this was happening to me so deepening my relationship with christ um made me realize that going unmatched was really the best thing for me a career and a surgical specialty um for someone like me who at my core is incredibly multifaceted was not going to contribute to my overall happiness being a surgeon would just take away from my ability to pursue any other interests outside of being a surgeon like no shade to surgeons the utmost respect for them but that is their life they are a surgeon even when they are not on the clock and i just knew that that was not going to be conducive to my overall happiness um, and so it was definitely something that I felt I had to let go. Um, and prayer really was just one aspect of the spiritual journey that um, I had committed to. I also, you know, made a conscious effort to read my Bible more frequently and also to um, attend church every Sunday, even if it was just virtually. I figured that if I could spend two hours 
in the gym throwing around some weights i could spend 20 minutes deepening my relationship with christ um and so that's really what made my you know spiritual journey a lot stronger working out um showed me that i could do hard things even in the midst of being in a hard situation and also showed me that i could commit to a routine even when everything else in my life was chaotic and i really didn't understand what was going on which way was up you know where i was going excuse me praying gave me an uncommon sense of peace that i did not feel in the first interview season as compared to the second interview season so and this is going to sound really arrogant because you know you really don't know and that's why they call it faith um but when i submitted my application the second time around i just knew i was going to match like i just knew that this was my year just because the favor that god had been showing me with every other decision because i put him first because i consulted with him on everything that i did the favor that he showed me at every avenue just made me realize that this was my year that this is the year that this is that this is the year that i am going to be able to testify to his goodness and to his grace and over my life and um that's exactly what happened babes i really wish i had <laughs> some other i really wish i had some other advice i really wish i had some other tea for you but i'm telling you when you put god first because they said to seek the kingdom of god first right when you put god first everything that your heart desires will fall in place you have to be unwaveringly confident and trusting him you can't you know kind of trust him you know one foot in one foot out it has to be wholeheartedly and that's exactly how i was i had let that part of myself die the part of me that wanted orthopedic surgery so bad when i let that desire die um and asked christ to increase in me the favor that i found in people of all specialties who wanted me to succeed in anesthesia was just completely unparalleled working out is really what kept me grounded but praying and getting closer to christ allowed me to ascend so the uh second to last question is how are you feeling about that school debt okay did it affect your mental health have you mentally detached and baby Ooh. i didn't worry about that <laughs> Okay, that is a future NECA problem. I have completely mentally detached from that the, those student loans because in my mind, this is good debt. Like this is this is debt that is going to help build up my future. And like 300 bands asking for payment on 300 bands when I'm making like 60k is asinine. Okay, like it is actually dumb as hell because who gonna pay that? Who gonna pay that when Jesus already paid the ultimate price on the cross, okay? Like, asking me to pay that is crazy. It is mad. And so yes, babe, I have completely mentally detached from it. It has not affected my mental health, not one bit, because I am on a financial uh, deference deferment i'm sorry deferment i am on a financial deferment so yes i have completely mentally detached from that nonsense i am not thinking about it it is a future NECA problem when i'm making those big girl checks until that time it ain't getting paid i'm hope i'm hoping that big joe is gonna come through on his promise where he is not gonna see me in the ballot box this this year, I don't even know when elections are. I don't even know why I'm talking like I care about politics. But I do care about these student loans. Yes, I do, because that is a problem that directly affects me. Finally, finally, the final question. You guys definitely wanted to know, why did I switch from ortho to anesthesia? What about anesthesia attracted me? And I'm here to give y'all the tea. I'm here to give y'all the sauce. So yes, again, this is the most asked question um, and during this Q&A, as well as during the interview season. I'm gonna be telling you guys some things that I did not tell the people on the interview trail, but um, you know, I had tried for orthopedic surgery. 
I had, after going unmatched, I had tried for orthopedic surgery for over three months and was getting rejected at every point. I would talk to some orthopedic surgeons and the way that they would speak to me, like questioning my capabilities, just overall rude, had me asking God, like, why is this not working out for me? What is going on? Why? And as a naturally high achieving person who has always performed well, who has always excelled, this was a big wake up call for me. I was like, what is going on? And I was so angry with God, like, why are you not opening this door? But the thing is, when God shuts the door, there's nothing that you can do to open it, baby. No man can open it, okay? And once I accepted that God was trying to redirect me, things started to fall in place. I got redirected to anesthesia and realized that the field of anesthesia just better aligns with who I am as a person. and um would also allow for me and my multifaceted interests to flourish i realized that if i had pursued a career in surgery i would have ultimately been unhappy as a provider because work would have been my life and that's just not me like that's just not me i enjoy having interests outside of medicine um and anesthesia just allow for those interests to flourish more fruitfully than a career in surgery. At the end of the day, I knew that I could only do my best work if I was happy as a provider. And I just felt like anesthesia would, a field, a career in anesthesia would just be more conducive to my overall happiness. And then why anesthesia? Excellent question. So, you know, like most candidates, I found anesthesia to be an attractive specialty because um, it is procedure dominant with an emphasis on physiology as well as pharmacology. After shadowing with my mentor, I realized that I really enjoyed several aspects about anesthesia that are just not apparent in other specialties. For example, the focused patient interactions um, and the knowledge basis that spans several specialties in order to handle a diverse caseload. Um, and the gratification that you get from relieving a patient's pain or reachieving hemodynamic stability in critical situations, um, as well as the non-traditional workflow, like the on and off type of pace that happens during um, our shifts as, as, a, as a doctor, because we do work in shifts. We're not every day like clinic or something like that. Um, so I just really enjoyed that flow and that pace of work. Plus the way that uh, anesthesiology contracts have been trending lately, the fellowship is not necessarily needed in order to be uh, fairly compensated in the field of anesthesia. So even though I was initially, you know, as a pre-med, initially captivated by the surgical spectacle and the charisma of the surgeons, um, ultimately, I just found that anesthesia was just more aligned with the, um, I just ultimately interpreted anesthesiologists as life support specialists with a life of their own. And that just, it just made more sense for me and the life that I want to live uh, moving forward. It's gas gang or bang, gas gang or nothing around here. So I really hope that you guys enjoyed this q and I really wanted to make sure that I touch on every little thing, every question, every aspect of my journey literally left no stone unturned if you guys have any additional questions or concerns feel please feel free to leave them in the comments thank you so so much for watching up until the end and if you guys like this video if you guys want any more other types of videos please just uh comment what you guys would like to see from me but thank you guys so much for watching and i hope to talk to you guys more bye